Good morning, family. How are you? And I hope your family has some good plans this weekend, and um, it's always a, a fun this time of year as we, as we rightfully so, uh, celebrate our freedom and, and the privileges and the things that have come at a great sacrifice um, for us to be where we are. And I, and I tell you, this afternoon, in fact, I'm getting on a plane to go to the other side of the world, and every time that I do that, um, you know, I thank God. Um, and as excited as it is about where I'm going and, and what I'm going to be seeing, you know, I am thankful for our country. I am thankful for our freedom. I am thankful that I got to grow up here and experience the things that I did. And, and I believe that's a blessing from God. And I believe that's okay to do that. But what does it mean to have freedom in Christ? You know, we just, we get so religious, don't we? And, and, and the word freedom, especially because we are in Western culture and a part of the United States. I mean, freedom is, is so much a part of our vocabulary that, again, we forget the sacrifices that it took to get there. You know, all of that and, and the sacrifices that Jesus did to bring us the freedom that we have in Christ. But sometimes we just take it for granted. And sometimes I believe in God's infinite wisdom, as a father, he disciplines us to give us perspective. That we don't take freedom for granted. And as important that is in a national sense, as much as I love the United States, that is not, not my primary kingdom. And so I want to know this morning, what does it mean to have freedom in Christ to the degree that it kind of gets to a place inside of me that I don't, I don't take it for granted anymore. What is it? Um, how are we supposed to live in it? And, and I think one of the best places to go will be the book of Galatians. So that's where we're going to be this morning. So if you turn in your devices or in, in your Bibles there to the book of Galatians, we'll be bouncing around the whole book. But really our anchor verse will be Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, when it says this. Paul writing to the church of Galatia, inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Do you see that responsibility right there? It's not that we got the freedom. It's not that, that we worked to get the freedom. It's not that we died to get the freedom. But still, there's this, this active participation in freedom that we have to stand firm in it then. And do not let yourselves, do you feel the re personal responsibility of that part of the verse? Be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You see, all through Scripture, Freedom's a big deal to Jesus. Now, not taking anything away from our salvation, but you've got to understand under the umbrella of salvation, there is this thing called freedom that Jesus died for. He died to save us, but he died to set us free. And lots of verses just kind of pop in my head. And, and, and I see two words, especially as, as I read through the New Testament associated with this Christian freedom. And the first one is the Holy Spirit. It says this, where the Spirit of the Lord is. Anybody finish that verse? There's freedom. There's freedom. So can I do the other side of that coin? Wherever there's captivity, wherever there is bondage, especially by choice, does that mean the Spirit of the Lord is not there? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And there's this other word besides Spirit that's associated throughout the New Testament that's associated with freedom. It's truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. And so we have these two words consistently throughout the book of Galatians and throughout the entire New Testament that are associated with our freedom, the spirit and truth. And I can't tell you how many times that the Holy Spirit is described, I think more than any other, as the spirit of truth. So what I want to present to you this morning is this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, 
You have the Holy Spirit. Lots of verses that talk about that. But it's still possible because Paul is writing to Christians. It is possible to have the Holy Spirit living in you, but yet still being bondage to things. Still be enslaved to things. I want to present to you this morning that if you're in bondage, you are running from the spirit of truth. And it's kind of hard to do if you're a believer because the Holy Spirit's actually in you, so good luck with that. But you see, there is whatever bondage it might be, whether it be emotional bondage or, or some kind of a physical bondage or, or mental bondage or, or not being able to get over the unresolved issues of, of your past, whatever your bondage might be, I am telling you, Holy Spirit wants to take a walk with you. And the Holy Spirit, if you have the courage, wants to tell you some truth. And what is it about that truth that sometimes it wells fear in us and it makes us run, it keeps us from being vulnerable? Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather more precisely, are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Now, every time Paul uses the word forces, he's very clearly talking about the demonic. Okay, now we're going to talk about different situations and different circumstances that will hold you in bondage even if you're a believer. And I'm not going to harp on this, but I want you to understand there are demonic forces back there pulling the strings behind these circumstances to keep you from walking in freedom in Jesus Christ. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against, paraphrase, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Ephesians chapter 6. And Paul, context of Galatians, Paul's kind of rude in Galatians. I'm reading through it going, well, that's not very nice, Paul. He calls the church there foolish. He's looking at him going basically to say maybe what our, our communion talk guy would say uh, this morning. You're being idiots. And, and as he's going through this, I'm going, okay, I can understand Paul because I, I kind of see Paul as a type A personality. But if I believe that Galatians was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was the Holy Spirit that upset with the church of Galatia? Well, think about it as a parent especially if those of you that maybe have grown children or if you have young children, think to the days ahead. Imagine your child going through an incredible amount of bondage emotionally, physically, through an addiction or, or, or whatever that was controlling their life. And imagine through God your child being set free from that. And then you got the call that they were walking back into bondage. What kind of things would stir up in you as a parent? How blunt would you be to your own children to keep them from walking back into that which they were freed from? You see, that's what was happening at the church of Galatia. They were walking back into bondage in two arenas that we're going to talk about this morning. And Paul is mad. He's frustrated with those that, that, that he helped bring to Christ, the church that he helped start in Galatia. He says, who has bewitched you in one verse? Who, why are you listening to these false teachers that are leading you back into the bondage that you have been set free from? And that's the passion behind his voice and behind the Holy Spirit's voice with those that have known the love of God are walking back into slavery. It says there at the end of that verse in Galatians 8 verse 9, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? I 
what is it? Uh, just the context there. They, they had Judaizer. They had Jewish Christians that were coming in and, 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 and basically uh, saying that, that they, they had to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. And, you know, for Gentile men especially, that was a hard pill to swallow for lots of different reasons. And they were saying, but that was the sign of being a believer is that you had to be circumcised or you really weren't a believer in Christ. And Paul was not about that because you could see from Galatians and other places, the sign of salvation is the Holy Spirit, not your work. And then also there were other teachers who were saying, oh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, were coming, hey, because you have grace, it's a free-for-all. Enjoy your sin. Paul wasn't about that either. And so he was dealing with these two different opposing false teachers, especially the Judaizers, but the others as well, that were coming in and, and leading the church back into slavery. And, and, and I just, it's so frustrating as a as someone who does counseling and discipling and those kinds of things, and, and you can attest to this, have you ever walked with someone through freedom and then they went back to where they were before and how it breaks your heart? I mean, you've tasted freedom. Why would you go back? But then I think back to Exodus. Do y'all know the story of the Exodus when the children of God were coming out? I mean, and you, you know the whole story. Moses and all that, Charleston Heston, the prince of Egypt, you know, all that. And, and as they're coming out of Egypt, they're singing and, and dancing and praising God because finally, after 400 years, they were going back to their homeland. They were free at last. And as soon as the road got rough, I, if, in Scripture it feels like days, but at, at the most it was weeks, at weeks, the moment they were thirsty, what did they do? They started grumbling and complaining in their freedom. They started whining in their freedom. And what did they say? Oh, we miss the good old days at Egypt. I know our slave masters beat us. We had no control, no choice in our life whatsoever. But at least we knew what was coming. At least we knew we'd have water and food. And, and, and I see this, why do people choose to go back to slavery? And I have a theory. People cho will choose many times the known of slavery instead of the unknown of freedom. People will choose time and time again the known. Even though the known's not that fun, at least it's known. At least you know what you're getting. Versus the unknown of freedom. And guess what the unknown of freedom requires? Stuff like choice, responsibility. And can I sum it up in one word for you? Do you know what freedom requires of everyone, whether they know it or not? Faith. And that unknown, that uncertainty of being free, of having to choose and what if you choose wrong? Of having to be responsible for your own actions. Why? Because you got to choose it. And especially to have faith and trust in the character and the nature of the one who liberated you from your bondage. So my questions this morning are twofold. We are freed from what to what? Because that's what I want to know. I need to know again what I'm freed from. But freedom's just not there for freedom. That's shallow. That's selfish. You see, I actually believe I grew up in the country that I did because I'm not freed just from something. I'm freed to something, and I have a responsibility. That's what I feel. So we're freed from what, but we're also freed to what. But to understand, we go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. So we, we're very clear on what it means to be enslaved to something. Again, false teachers are coming into uh, Peter's recipients here as well. And, and Peter says this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they promise them freedom while them, them, they themselves are slaves of depravity, sin. But here's the definition. For people are slaves of to whatever has mastered them. 
do you know one of the most foundational concepts of being a Christian? I only have one master. And it's Jesus. And if anything else in my life has taken the mastery role. What's the mastery role? You make decisions in life based upon that. You think about that first thing in the morning. That, whatever is your master, consumes your thoughts all the time, which means consumes the entire direction of your life. If that is anything other than Jesus, you, my friend, I'm just telling you the truth. You are a slave. But there's good news. There's someone who liberates you. So freedom from what? Well, it goes back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, when it, it says, we are, don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Again, these are, these are old agricultural words that I think we need a visual representation of. Can we bring the picture up that I have next on the slides? Just remember what a yoke is, right? Whether it be oxen or cows or donkeys or whatever it might be it was the it was the thing that the the thing that would stretch out among them that would keep the animals in sync so that the master could could accomplish what he wanted to accomplish whether it be plowing or clearing a field or or moving rocks or whatever it was and those things had to obviously move in unison and, and Paul is saying this is what slavery looks like Kind of looks like shackles, doesn't it? A little bit. This is what slavery looks like. You think you're in control of your life, but you are not. And you are being led around by a master. So my, my question to you this morning is, what are you yoked to? Now, of course, we think about the passage. I don't have it, on, but in Matthew 11, when it talks about Jesus says, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he actually does say, take my yoke upon me, Jesus says, and learn from me, for I am humble and I am gentle at heart. Wow, a, a humble master? A gentle master? And someone that can actually get stuff done as far as work? on the planet this morning there's a question and you know me I like to post questions what are you yoked to what's determining truly the course of your life what are the decisions based upon let me ask I'm going to tell you this when you are yoked in the sense of being a slave instead of yoked to Jesus or I would say to the Holy Spirit if you're following the Galatians vocabulary when you are yoked to the world, when you're yoked to your flesh or whatever that we're going to talk about in a minute, you carry the weight for the benefit of your master. Do you know that? And go back to the verses that we read before about the forces that are pulling the strings behind all that. You carry the weight for your master if you're yoked in slavery, but not in the kingdom of God. Do you know what's beautiful about being yoked to Jesus? The master carries the weight for you. Your job's just to keep up. Your job's to keep in step. Your job's to keep in rhythm. But he carries his weight. And if the gospel story means anything to me, he carried Billy Gurley's weight. And my job is to be in his flow and in his rhythm. It's a beautiful thing if you actually have the right master. So the two things that we are yoked to in slavery from the book of Galatians is the first one is that we are yoked to our sinful nature. That we are a slave to the flesh or the sinful nature. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 says this, The acts of the flesh, y'all know this, right? The acts of the world, the acts of the flesh, these things are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. I wish I had enough time to define all these another time maybe. Hatred, 
discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why do people who live like this not inherit the kingdom of God? Because Jesus is not their king. Let's just think rationally. Jesus is not their master. They have other masters. It's these guys are their masters. So obviously, if you're not going to submit to the king, you don't get the king dumb. You don't get the king's dominion in your life. Why? Because you are slaves by choice to other masters. And, and, and any addict will tell you whether that addiction is sexual addiction, uh, substance abuse, um, emotional dysfunction. They'll all tell you they desire to be better, but they just feel like they can't. That they want to be more than they are because they know that they're better than this, but they can't seem to get out of it. That's the nature of captivity. But the truth is we're all and have all been addicts, haven't we? You could probably pick one thing out of that list that at one point in your life determined the course of your day instead of Jesus. And so we become slaves to this. And I'm telling you what, your flesh, your own flesh, there's someone pulling the strings behind it, but your own flesh is the worst slave master of all. It always leads you on a journey of self-destruction with demons as your guide. And I think we get that. Whether we've struggled with major addictions or not, like I said, we're all addicts. We've seen enough of it in this world to know that the acts of the sinful nature leave, lead nowhere but to death. But that's not the only thing and not the bulk of what Galatians is talking about being enslaved to. See, we're not only slaves to our sinful nature, we can be slaves to our legalistic religion. And to Paul, this might be the worst of the two. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Paul, I mean, you got to get the tone of this. Imagine a dad or a mom going to their child who's gone back into slavery. And you're trying to choose your words carefully that will jolt them out of heading in the wrong direction, back to things that lead to death, back to things that lead to slavery, because every good parent wants their children to be free, to be who they really are. So in that tone, hear Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I would like to learn just one thing from you, but he asked two questions. Sorry, Paul, you did. He said one, but he asked two. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Question number one. Are you so foolish? Rude. After, then question number two. After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Two different questions. So let's go into these questions a bit because the, the truth of the matter is is that um, there's a lot of people in this room who used to be bound by legalistic re religion. And sometimes, can I be honest? It's tempting to go back. Man, just give me a list, right? Let's just make it about rules. Even though it's impossible, the whole Old Testament's written that you'll never be able to follow them. And so we are drawn back to those, those things. And so he asked them, did you, the first question, did you, at, and, and again, when you receive the Spirit is at your salvation. So he's asking them to go back and to remember their conversion, to remember that moment when they were saved when they received the Spirit. So, so when you got saved, was it really about His work or yours? Was it, was it about works then? 
Or, or was it really about believing in Jesus? I'm going to thread a needle here. Because the enemy can take what I'm going to say and use it to make you doubt. And I do not want that to happen. But just because a truth is weighty and can be used the wrong way doesn't mean you still don't speak it. I've got your attention, okay? There is such a thing as the religious lost. There is such a thing as people who think they're saved because of their religion and those people do not know Jesus. Now, don't let the enemy come in and make you doubt your salvation right now. Here's the thing. We can ask a lot of questions at that moment. Do you remember it? At that moment, or time after that, by the way. We don't have to go back to that one moment. Or, or, or some time after that. Was it completely about you doing a religious work? Or was it because you believed in your heart and you wanted to know this Jesus? There is that passage. Don't like it either in Matthew chapter 7, right? People are coming to him. And he says, depart from me, I didn't know you. And they use the word Lord. It sounds like they're religious to me. And you know what their excuses was when Jesus was saying, I don't know you. And what did they say? But Jesus, I did what? I did this, I did this, and I did this. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll say it again. I don't know you. Sometimes I do marriage counseling, and guys can be doofuses. Can we just own that? <laughs> Women, you can be some crazy sometimes, but guys, we can be jerks, and we can be doofuses. Just a matter of perspective, I guess. I can't tell you how many times that, that, that the wife is, is pouring out her heart of just wanting to be known just wanting to be seen. And what does the doofus say? But I do this, I do this, I work for a living, I bring home the bacon, I wash the dishes last night, and I just want to go, shh. Don't you see? It's the same thing with Christ. It's not what you did. Did you know him? And at that moment of salvation, let me ask you this. Were you following a formula to be saved or was your heart being drawn to believing in the Savior of the universe? Because there's a huge difference. And I don't care how good the plan was. I don't care how biblical the elements of the plan were. If you didn't believe and you were believing in his work and not what you were doing at the time to save you I love you but that was not a salvation moment pray you had one after that but that wasn't it this is the kind of verbiage that Paul is talking about to the church in Galatia he says, legalistic religion is based upon being right and doing the right works instead of believing and knowing Jesus. Now, James is clear. Without works, faith is dead. So it's not about not seeking truth. And it's definitely not, not about obedience and following him. That's kind of the fruit of lordship, isn't it? But this is one area that you cannot get the cart before the horse. The basis of Christianity is Jesus' work, not yours. 
just questions, and, and I'm trying to help us get this, right? This is, this is about believing in Jesus instead of coming up, and boy, don't we like our religious formulas? Aren't we so proud of ourselves when we come up with our steps? Not knocking it. Cool plan, fine. Did you know him? Is there fruit of your life? There is such a thing as a religious loss. First question. But the second question is this. Paul would say, okay, if, if you had that moment, it was about his work, not yours. Okay? Where did it switch for you? Why did you think it was by faith that you came to know Jesus, but as far as your transformation and as far as your spiritual maturity, it's all about your work? Where, where did it switch for you? He would go in there and he would start saying, when did it become about striving instead of believing? Paul's asking an honest question. When did it become about the law instead of the spirit? When did it become about being religious instead of a friendship with God. Tell me, where did it switch? Because we have this concept sometime that, that, it is, that it is something can start in the spirit and with faith, but somehow it'll be perfected in the flesh. You can't fix yourself still. You couldn't fix yourself at the moment of salvation. But I'm telling you here, believers who have the Holy Spirit, you still can't. Is there a responsibility? Of course there is. But you have to understand it is still by faith. It is still by trust. It is still by believing in his finished work. And from that place, I go to work. I work from a place of grace, not to get it. I work from a, from a place of of security in my relationship with God, and that's why I do the things that I, that I do. Not because I feel like I still have to gain his approval. You were freed from that legalistic mindset. Don't be yoked with it again. Let's bring up that picture again of the yoke. I'm going to ask you again. Are you yoked to anything but Jesus Christ? And really, the yoke doesn't work with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit never says we're yoked to the Holy Spirit. You know what it says we are with the Holy Spirit? One. We're one. It's even more than that. It's one. Where the Holy Spirit goes, it's not even, it's like we're one with each other. We're one with the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. We're not led by the law. Who are you yoked with? Your flesh, legalistic religion, or Jesus and the Holy Spirit? That's what we're freed from. But what are we freed to is the question. What are we freed to? And I'm thinking about all the things that, and there's, there could be a list of what we're freed to. What are we freed to? And, and, and as I began to, to think about this, I, first of all, we're free to have a relationship with God, obviously. Let, let me say this. Slavery always divides. And freedom always gives you the opportunity to unite. Say it again. Slavery always divides. Just think about church history, you history students. Anytime there's slavery, there's division. Both politically, obviously with family units, all the things that are associated with slavery. Slavery always divides Freedom always gives you the chance to unite. And the first thing that we're united with is God. What happened when Jesus died and took on our sins in the temple? The veil that separated us from God was torn from the top to the bottom. And that's a big, thick veil. Go read your Bibles. And that separation, that barrier, that division is gone so that we now all equally have access to our Father. We have access to God. Of course, that is paramount to what we're freed to. We're freed to God, but we're also freed to his kingdom. You know what slaves get to do when they, when they become free? They get to go home. 
They get to go back to their, to their culture. They get to go back to their context when they're slaves. The two times when the nation of Israel were slaves and God freed them, they went back to Jerusalem both times in the Old Testament. You get to go back to your culture. You get to experience the kingdom of God. So we're not only, we're not only saved to be united with God, we're saved to be united to our culture, our kingdom. But as I, as I read about people being enslaved this week and what they wanted to do with their freedom, you know what a lot of them said? I want to see my family. I want to see my dad, my mom, my aunts, my uncles. Slavery has divided me from the people I love. And now I have the choice and over and over again, I, I believe in the spiritual context, we are freed to a united family. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says this, For he himself is our peace. He who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Obviously, he's talking about there the same thing that... that um, Paul was addressing to the church in Galatia that Jew and Gentile rift and all the things that were associated with these two religions and these two cultures becoming one now under Christ. Most of the New Testament, by the way, deals with this thing. And, and when you talk about having a united family, you have to understand when you are yoked to the flesh, it is all about you, isn't it? When you're being a slave to the sinful nature, it's all about you and selfishness always divides. And when you are yoked to a legalistic religion, because you have to be right and you have to be self-righteous, you have to understand that divides. And so what does it mean for this, this people that were separated, for this dividing wall of hostility to come down and for them to have at least the choice? And at least the opportunity for them to be one again. Can we have that picture up? I grew up during the Cold War. I was a kid during the Cold War. And every once in a while, we'd get a little scare. I know y'all had one in the 60s that was even more so than, than my generation. But, but every once in a while, you would hear something, but it was just something commonplace. Y'all know what this is, right? This is the Berlin Wall, dividing West and East Germany communism in, in the West, East, West, all of that. Happened in the 1960s, was not taken down entirely to 1991, but obviously the beginning of the wall came down in 1989. So listen to me, overnight, the city was divided in two. And they didn't have time to get to their family. Can you imagine, for 30 years, not being able to see your family because of a dividing wall of hostility, because of the two political things that were going on at the time. You couldn't enjoy the family meals. You couldn't do the things that you did because overnight someone came in the middle of the night and divided your city and divided your family. Imagine with me when that wall came down. Can you imagine when the, the first, and they, 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 they knew it was coming down, but they couldn't help themselves. So you remember they started getting sledgehammers, started knocking it down themselves. Can you imagine the family reunions? For some of the younger ones, they had never known life without the wall. And getting to meet family for the first time. And experiencing that community for the first time. And, and I think when, when it talks about to the church at Ephesus, he divided the wall of hostility. Man, what was that like? Galatians chapter 3, back to our book this morning, it says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All of you are. 
I don't care what side of the wall you were on, the west or the east, or the side of that topic that you fell on. You are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ Jesus. You have clothed yourself with Christ. And here's the point. So now there, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. Well, there's male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, I have to put the caveat here. This doesn't mean that this takes away diversity. This is unity in diversity. This is us all coming together and recognizing that we are all children of God, no matter where we fell before on those distinctions that Paul listed. And now as this freedom has come about, is that now we can, we can start living and experiencing life together. So the Gentile, man, a Gentile can be brothers and sisters with a Jew. Now when it says Jew, Gentile, this is more than just ethnicity here. This is a cultural barrier, obviously. This is the dividing wall of race that came down through Jesus Christ. But it's also the dividing wall of religion. Because they were one and the same to them. And when that dividing wall came down, all of a sudden the Gentiles were grafted into the tree of the family of God, as the New Testament said. And it was just really, really difficult for the Jews to accept. They had equal access to God. And that the Jewish story all of a sudden, just because they said yes to Jesus became their story as well. Wait a second. Our people died for this. Our people struggled for this. Our people were persecuted for this. You haven't earned. Ooh, there it is, isn't it? You haven't earned this. Isn't that the clinch pen? And so now the Gentile. And this dividing wall of hostility, this wall of race, and this wall of religion comes down. And you can just see throughout the course of human history. And let me even say this. Talking about the dividing wall of race that has plagued most, most of human history. Do you know the institution that propped it up so it could survive? The dividing wall of race always been the church there's no way that racism can survive without it being perpetuated from a religious institution just a student of church history and so this dividing wall of hostility comes down and now we can be brothers and sisters with people who don't look like us and don't have the culture that we have and even those that don't have the religious experiences we had and they believe that Jesus is the way the truth and the life and they believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they put their faith and their trust in Jesus alone and guess what now we have a, at least a choice to have a lot bigger family than we ever thought we had. But it wasn't just the Jew or the Gentile. It was the slave or the free. Now, in today's terminology, it was literal back then. But in our terminology, this is definitely the socioeconomic wall. And you know what? I have, I have some friends. I have a lot of friends that are very, very, very wealthy. And, and I got some friends that, man, they can't, they can't squeeze two nickels together. <laughs> You know, they're both my friends. So I got to live in both worlds a little bit. And it's funny how they judge each other. Can I be honest? You know what the wealthy judge the poor as? Lack of initiative. Because a lot of them, I mean, they're type A's, they're driven, they have that ambition, they have that drive, and, and they've taken advantage of the freedoms that they had, and they made a lot of money, and they just don't understand why everybody isn't wealthy almost to the borderline of calling the poor lazy. Ooh, but it's ugly on the other side too. So jealous of success. So quick to, to dismiss the hard work 
to dismiss the sacrifice that it took. That they can't celebrate the victories of their brothers and sisters who are, are accumulating and God is giving them wealth because of their own jealousy about their own place and their own station in life if you will this socioeconomic I don't have to preach on it you've lived it your whole life tension between the two and the loving remedy of Jesus Christ is two words generosity and contentment generosity and contentment he gave us the answers to heal the rift to be able to walk across the wall, this dividing hostility of this socioeconomic division. But then it gets down and it starts getting personal and it starts talking about male or female. And I hate the way the culture is perverting this, saying that there is no difference between the two. That's the Greek word called bologna, baloney. But the difference is, the, the, let me ask you this. The first rift after the crunching of the fruit wasn't it between the husband and the wife? What's the first thing the guy did? Oh, Adam, when the father comes. That woman you gave me? And we've been doing it ever since. I'm not going to assume authority. I'm not going to assume responsibility. It's that woman. And this rift starts happening. And it can happen between the male and the female in lots of different ways. And the culture is confused about that. But can I tell you, that's all a distraction. You know what we need to be talking about? Marriages. That's a distraction. Marriages. This dividing wall of hostility between the male and the female. Jesus has won this battle. And that we are free to choose each other every day of our life. I choose you again. I choose you again. You're a doofus. I know. But I still choose you. And we get to have this incredible journey of the two, taking a lifetime, by the way, becoming one to help us understand the nature of God better. Could I show this last picture that I have up here? There's a lot of famous pictures about the Berlin Wall. And I looked through them, you know, the sledgehammer and all that. This one captured me. Look at the faces of the people. I see smiles and excitement. I see mouths open. I see hugs and I see embrace. But look at the gap in the wall. Are you seeing what I see? You know what I see in the faces of those young men? by the looks of their age, have never lived life without the wall? Uncertainty. I see nervousness. Look, probably I'm assuming they're from the east. Looks like they're soldiers. What does this mean for them? And do you see them not really crossing the barrier? even though the barrier is clearly torn down. My heart aches for those of us that live in that spot instead of the embrace and the smiles and the community that Jesus died to give us. You see, it's that slavery thing again, isn't it? The known of slavery is less scary than the unknown of freedom. A lot more risk on the other side of that wall. A lot more faith. A lot more vulnerability. A lot more chances to be rejected on the other side of that wall. And so we stand at the precipice. The veil has been torn that's divided not only us and God and us and the kingdom, but us from each other. And we stand on that precipice within our cities. And we're so comfortable with our race. And we're so comfortable with our religion and what we're used to. And so we stand on the gap. Uh, I don't know. And then, and then the socioeconomic, where you actually find a person of wealth that you actually like, but there's something a part of you goes, I don't know if I can trust a wealthy person. 
And you see this person because you have money who is a hard worker, has an incredible work ethic, but yet they haven't received the economic blessing. And this, this opportunity to stand on the precipice of the socioeconomic barrier and go, are you really my brother? And the worst is marriage. When we see that the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down between the husband and the wife, but because we would rather be comfortable than love our spouse the way Jesus loves them, we won't cross the way that's clearly been made for us. What do slaves really want? They want their family. How about we take advantage and let's sacrifice the comforts of the known for the discomforts of the unknown to get the benefit of every single thing that Jesus died to give his family. Galatians 5.1 again, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm them and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. When I look at my children, they're grown now. I want them to have freedom because I want them to fulfill their destiny. But the truth is, they still have to choose freedom. And every single beating heart in this room right now, you have a choice to make. The wall's been knocked down. You don't have to live under the yoke of slavery anymore. And if you have the courage to leave your slave comfort, you'll experience a family quite like you never knew you had. If I can do anything for you, if, we, if this church could pray for you, we'll be down front as we stand and sing.